And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines. I'm sorry, headlines I came up a little bit while ago. <laughs> Simple keywords. Adam joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Adam. <laughs> Good morning, Lena. <laughs> Old habits die hard. My apologies. <laughs> it's like you push me and you play the keyword logo and that's where I go to. Good morning. <laughs> all right. Good morning, Lena. <laughs> I think we're all ready to get into keyword news. We're going to try to clarify some of these major headlines for our listeners. And this is our first pick of the day. Revamp old homes. So President Yoon said his government will revise procedures to allow the start of reconstruction of apartments that are over 30 years old, even without passing a safety inspection. So they're easing regulations, uh, uh, blocking this reconstruction process and approval for old homes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, He made the pledge during a policy debate with the land ministry and members uh, of the public. Uh, It was the second, actually, in a series of government policy briefings uh, marking the start of the new year. He's changed this format and uh, from these uh, ministry briefings to, you know, kind of town hall style uh, debates, if you will. Now, mm-hmm. current regulations require a home to fail, actually, a safety inspection in order to be designated for redevelopment or reconstruction, basically giving it a reason to be uh, reconstructed. Now, you said last month that this has led people to want their homes to become uh, unsafe. So any investors in apartments, they Uh, would have uh, an opportunity for their apartments or investments to be uh, revamped. Now, under the new measure, homes will be eligible for reconstruction if living conditions have deteriorated due to issues such as, say, lack of parking spaces, excessive noise between floors and plumbing problems as well. Uh, Now, Yoon uh, pledged to simplify redevelopment and reconstruction procedures Uh, abolish heavy taxation on multiple property owners and commence reconstruction of the what's known as first generation new cities during this uh, term. They're ironically called new cities, but they are kind of outdated uh, now. Now, you criticize the punitive taxation uh, on multiple property owners as a mistake, saying it ultimately harms uh, ordinary people and tenants. And he also addressed the Uh, aging uh, new cities or first generation new cities say he will transform these cities into desirable uh, urban areas. So not just the apartments, but uh, the areas in which they are in. Uh, Yoon also emphasizes focus on supplying various types of housing as well for uh, single and double occupancies, Mm -hmm. especially for uh, young people and uh, newlyweds as well. I think in that entire uh, first key word, desirable is like the biggest takeaway. I mean, it's not just about, you know, creating these new cities. It's about maintaining it and upkeeping it so it remains desirable for young workers Mm. and ask for these tax breaks and uh, different uh, fast tracks to allow reconstruction projects to go about. We'll wait and see. Uh, The the promises seem hefty. Now, can all of it be realized? We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, that is a question. I mean, it is uh, a lot of apartments. There's a lot of talk about reconstruction. It's called Chegonchug in uh, Korea. Basically, (laughs) reconstruction uh, literally translates to... Why would you go there? (laughs) (laughs) uh, Yeah, but there's a lot of promises of these with these, uh, say, aging apartments, Mm -hmm. but usually they're kind of left on the back burner and it doesn't take... uh, It it takes uh, years for Mm -hmm. it to actually realise. And some, most of the time, they actually just get swept under the rug and doesn't happen at all. So I think President Yoon wants these to kind of, you know, to start kicking off. I mean, I, I'm sure each apartment complex is different as own set of issues. But if you look at, you know, some of the more desirable apartments, uh, definitely there's a tug of war between those who want to reconstruct and the tenants who want more money out of it right. either mm-hmm. or some sort of tax break. But so that tug of war continues for sometimes years. Mm. <laughs> at least. <laughs> uh, sometimes decades. We'll leave it there for now as we move on <laughs> to our second keyword of the day. Condemning North Korea. The new national security advisors of South Korea, uh, Tang Wo-jin, has held his first phone call with his U.S. counterpart, Jake Sullivan. What did they discuss? Right. So the two officials condemned uh, in the strongest possible terms North Korea's transfer of ballistic missiles to Russia, as well as Russia's use of these missiles against Ukraine. They noted that the transfer 
Uh, and use of these weapons increases the suffering of the Ukrainian people and violates multiple human security council resolutions, as well as undermine the global non-proliferation regime and its significant security impl impl implications rather for Europe, uh, the Korean Peninsula, as well as the Indo-Pacific region. They also discuss the North's increasing provocative actions along the demilitarized zone, separating the two Koreas, and they committed to maintaining close cooperation uh, in support of Ukraine, as well as close co collaboration on shared uh, security challenges to bolster peace and security across uh, the Indo-Pacific region, as well as around the globe. Now, Chang also noted that last year was a symbolic year for the re uh, development of the South Korea-US alliance, as well as trilateral cooperation, including Japan as well. Now, previously, uh, the US did say that Russia used ballistic missiles supplied by North Korea uh, in a series of attacks on Ukraine, and that it is also working on brokering another deal with Iran for additional uh, arms as well. So there's a potential other area of concern, both for South Korea uh, and the US. And Chang also expressed his wish for close cooperation with Sullivan for further development of their country's alliance across the areas of extended deterrence, as well as their Indo-Pacific strategies, as well as emerging technologies and economic security um, as well. And Sullivan expressed a similar sentiment mm. in that regard. And on to our third key word of the day. Out of hospital. So the Democratic Party leader Lee Jae-myung is now out of the hospital after he was stabbed in the neck. Uh, it's it was it eight days or nine days, uh, but mm. he's out of the hospital. And right. in his first interview, he says it is time to put an end to politics driven by hatred. What's the latest, Adam? Yeah, so he was uh, speaking to reporters upon his release from the Seoul National University Hospital. He first apologized for causing concern to the public and thanked them for their uh, support. Now, he then said it is time to put an end to what he called warlike politics and restore politics to a state of mutual respect and coexistence. He added that he will live uh, the rest of his life uh, only for the people. And he also thanked the citizens of Pusan, where the incident happened, as well as the first responders and the medical staff of Pusan National University Hospital, where he was first uh, sent, uh, as well as the medical team at Seoul National University Hospital as well. Uh, he is expected to continue his treatment at home uh, for the time being. Now, uh, the ruling People Power Party also said it strongly condemns the attack that threatened democracy, uh, and the party also wished for E's speedy recovery. Uh, the party spokesperson, Yui Sok, said he agrees with E that conflict and division should be eradicated in politics. Uh, and the party also attributed the root cause of the incident to the prevalence of uh, extreme politics that capitalizes on social conflicts. And the spokesperson stated that those who sympathize with or spread conspiracy theories and fake news that undermine social trust uh, should not be allowed in politics. And he added that the police must also... Uh, provide a detailed, transparent explanation uh, to the public about the motive and circumstances mm. of the crime. Speaking of which, the actual suspect said that he committed the crime and the uh, attack because he didn't want E to become president. Uh, president. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a touchy subject, isn't it? Uh, the spread mm. of fake news and conspiracy theories. And clearly, South Korea is not the only one uh, facing such difficulties. You bring in things like deep fake and it becomes mm. infinitely more complicated. For I understand from this year's general elections, deep fake can't be used even as, uh, as a means of comedy or jokes or definitely not mm. on the campaign trail either. But nonetheless... Right. Uh, at least the DP chief is doing well. He's out of the hospital. And maybe, maybe we can get back to campaigning. Mm. All right, let's move on to our fourth keyword of the day. Aging population. So Korea's elderly population aged 70 and older outnumbered those in their 20s for the very first time last year. It further highlights the nation's rapidly aging population. Can you tell us more? Yeah, so uh, more unfortunate uh, data coming out uh, in terms of, you know, low birth rates uh, and all these demographic problems that the nation is facing. Uh, and this time round, government data shows that the number of people aged 70 years and over totaled, uh, totaled 6.32 million at the end of last year, surpassing the population in their 20s, tallied at 6.2 uh, million. Uh, the population aged 
65 and older uh, has gradually increased, reaching 9.73 million uh, last year. That's up by 460,000 people from the previous year. They account for 19% uh, of the total population. Now, of Korea's 17 major cities and provinces, eight were categorized as a super-aged society. That's where people age 65 and older make up over 20% of the total population. Now, North Chungcheong province and South Gyeongsang province were newly added to the list uh, last year. So there's more areas and regions popping up that uh, have these over or um, uh, elderly uh, or overaged, superaged rather, populations. And because of this, student enrollment as well and elementary schools actually dropped mm. below 400,000 for the first time uh, last year as well. That came as the number of children aged six only came to uh, just over 354,740. Uh, now, Korea has seen its population fall each year since 2020 when it recorded its first population decline. The ratio of the working age population, or people aged 15 to 64, declined just below 1% from a year ago to about 35.9 million. That's 70% of the total number of registered residents. So that is the main concern, isn't it? The older mm. um, the population gets, the less uh, uh, economically active population um, uh, is uh, uh, prevalent now. Higher. Yeah, available. And uh, meanwhile, the population gap between the capital and other regions has widened to an unprecedented uh, level as well. The number of people living in the Greater Salt area stood at 26 million people last year, over 700,000 people more than those living outside of the capital. So there's still that issue of the majority of the population in Korea being concentrated in the capital region and other areas kind of being left out and uh, these rural areas especially being mm. dominated by uh, elderly people as well. So, of course, economic activity in those areas mm. tends to dwindle because of that. Mm. And that's why the government is trying to, you know, push for redevelopment of these areas and mm. try and make these kind of areas outside of Seoul, a bit more enticing for uh, young people as well. But I think we keep throwing in the key word there, enticing. Was it attractive, desirable? The, I mean, you have to mm. make it worthwhile for the young working population to want to relocate there, not just outliers who decide enough with Seoul and, and buy old house <laughs> and reconstruct as a vacation home. I think those are, I mean, right. it's an amazing story and I've thought about it, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> it just sounded like the worst investment I could think of. Right. I mean, uh, still at this moment, yes, everything is very much focused and centered around the capital. Right. Uh, a lot of investments uh, happen here uh, here as well in, in Seoul. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's not just about, you know, uh, attractive housing and making them, you know, brand spanking new and modern and contemporary. Because even, <laughs> yeah, even that will age. Yeah, even that will age as well. That's only temporary and uh, it only lasts for so long. But mm. this is basically the whole infrastructure uh, it needs to be kind of like a copycat of the capital, but elsewhere. And <laughs> does that happen in a short amount of time? Certainly not. Will it happen even in our generation? Mm. Uh, that's another question as well. It's, we're talking about, you know, revamping a whole city Right. and multiple cities at that as well. But it's certainly something that the government has its eye on, especially this government, uh, the UN administration. So we'll have to see what kind of policies and uh, how... Uh, such plans will move forward. It's about building identity. I mean, if you look at cities that were successful, like Sejong, for example, I mean, they took right. government complexes there. I mean, if you look at certain factories, massive factories around it, the neighborhoods would also become better. Mm. Pyeongtaek, because the U.S. space moved, suddenly looks more right. attractive. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are some efforts being held so already. I mean, uh, government complexes in Sejong as well. But does that mean that other young people who aren't government workers want to move not. there? Well, of course not. Tejon as well being mm. uh, dubbed, you know, a tech city with yeah. a KAIST university there as well. A lot of, you know, brands making new buildings and stuff. Right, right. Do young people still want to go there? <laughs> I, I've actually asked people who have, who've actually lived in Tejon and said it's still quite boring and there's nothing much to do. So that's another question that the government will try to, I'm not trying to, you know, um, you know, offend anyone who's living in Tejon or Tejon residents. But that is kind of the opinions that I've got from people who lived there previously mm -hmm. and still do live there at the moment as well. So, yeah, a lot of questions to tackle and resolve. Yeah. All right. With that, we move on to our final key word of the day. Subway dust removal. 
So Seoul's subway operator has revealed plans to significantly reduce fine dust concentrations at subway stations in the capital. How would they do that? Tell us the details. Yeah, so this is kind of a major project, basically. I mean, uh, Korea's subway system uh, and environment is actually not that bad if we look at other places around the world as well. I mean, I, grew, uh, growing up in London, have certainly <laughs> called uh, or uh, expressed the need for uh, London tubes to be uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, uh, improved a lot and become more modern. So in there are some countries, uh, New York subway system as well. That's another probably uh, subway system that needs a bit of improvement. But anyway, Seoul Metro says exhaust ventilation systems uh, will be installed at more subway platforms this year. It's also upgrading the existing gravel as well on subway tracks to com- uh, to concrete uh, to prevent dust uh, generation as well. This is probably due to the fact that gravel moves around and, of course, um, uh, it's a, a cause for some dust particles to move around as well. Uh, this is all part of a three-year investment of 300 billion won. Now, Seoul aims to reduce ultrafine dust to 36 uh, percent uh, below the legal standard by 2026. The plan includes tailored solutions for tunnels as well as platforms and waiting areas based on the specific causes of fine dust at each location. Of the 678 subway tunnels, 259 with outdated ventilation systems will be completely upgraded to increase exhaust capacity. Platform air quality, the area where people mostly are, is also being managed to force ventilation systems that purify air from the lower part of the platform and expel it outside will be installed. Uh, actually, 10 ventilation systems were installed at Chongno uh, 5 station in downtown Seoul uh, last year, and they will be gradually expanded to 34 subway platforms um, by 2020. Six. Now, Seoul Metro plans to prioritize implementation along subway line number one, where space restrictions make replacing air ventilation systems a bit challenging. Um, stations like Atasan Station on line five, located near mountains, uh, amusement parks uh, or parks, will have dust absorbing mats at the gates of waiting areas to prevent uh, outside dust being carried by passengers from entering the platforms and trains as well. Thank you very much, Anna, for today's coverage. One of our listeners, Hartley, chiming in. Until you've smelled a New York City sewer, you have not lived, my friend. There's nothing like it. Sounds lovely. (laughs) Yeah, the London tube as well. I mean, there's, uh, you know, rats running around there as well. So that's a whole other thing to talk about. It could uh, could be Remy. It could be your friend. Just kidding. Have a great day, Adam. I'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) You're very welcome. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.